Hey everyone, let's move on to shunt stub matching. <clears throat> so we just went through a brief exercise on how series stub matching works. So let's take a look at how the, the equivalent sort of ideas translate in the term, into the shunt stub. So for this little exercise, I went ahead and got myself an actual honest to goodness Smith chart here. <laughs> so remember here, all other things being equal, ignore the existence of all this stuff for now. There is just some reflection coefficient between here this transmission line and the load, right? So remember, the first things first, we could calculate the normalized load impedance as Z sub L over Z naught, which will evaluate to some uh, normalized real resistance plus some J XL like that. So how would that work? So there's two ways you can go about it. First, you can calculate the reflection coefficient as Z L minus Z naught over Z L plus Z naught, or you can normalize the load impedance and pick some circle here. So a simple example would be something like, hypothetically, suppose my capital ZL load is 100 ohms plus J50, right? <clears throat> and if I want to uh, match this to a 50 ohm line, that would imply little Z, so let's write this little ZL without the, the little center thing, is going to be two plus J1. Okay, so how would I mark this on the Smith chart? You just find the real value of two plus one J corresponds to a point right there. Okay, so that is how we, we do the, the, the crossover back and forth. So you should have done a lot of this back in 3300. So time to shake off some of those cobwebs. <clears throat> so first things first, we have this series piece of transmission line. And there will of course naturally be some equivalent input impedance looking down towards this length of line plus the load. So I'm gonna call that like, I don't know, Z in one, right? So how, what happens as I vary Z? What does this point do? Well, we know it's just gonna traverse a circle centered about the origin here. So ideally this would be the time to have a, a compass for drawing nice and neat circles, but I don't have a compass. So one thing you can do is just measure the distance from the origin here, and it's about three and a half centimeters. So that will imply if I rotate a bit, I've got three and a half there, three and a half there. So this is, is a very, very crude approximation to a circle when you don't have a, a true compass to draw a nice neat circle with it. All right, so you just bear with this for a sec, like so. Now I'm just gonna play connect the dots right here. Okay, so here is my circle. It's not the best circle in the world, but you get the idea. Okay, so as I move D down the line, some number of wavelengths, this little point here, let's get it nice and thick, is going to traverse this circle in the clockwise direction. Remember, that, that's the, the reflection coefficient seen looking into a transmission line. Again, it's just the accumulated phase of going down and back which is why you see wavelengths towards generator here. <clears throat> and it should be a half a wavelength is one full revolution. So you see 0.49 and then zero again. So 0.5 wavelengths is one full revolution here. So now what happens when I add this shunt stub here? So let, Remember, we, when we had a parallel shunt uh, reactance or admittance, or I guess susceptance here, remember we, we did this same exercise, but instead of the shunt stub, we just had this little JB term here instead. So instead of following these circles here, it followed the opposite circles over on the mirrored side of the Smith chart. So our goal, we had to pick, we had to find just the right, uh, reactance here that put us on this circle here. So I'm definitely not drawing the best circle in the world, but that's okay. You hopefully get the idea. But this is our magic circle, where if I add some, some reactants in parallel here, I will traverse this circle. So my goal is to pick D such that I either intersect at this point here or that point there. Both of them are totally valid. And then by adding some length L, I will suddenly take this sharp left turn here and come around the circle until eventually I land here at the origin. Or alternatively, I come all the way around to this point, and then as I add the L, I suddenly take my sharp right turn and I can uh, come down to the origin. So graphically, that is a nice way to visualize what's going on. However, we don't really have 
admittance circles. And if you tried to plot a bunch of admittance circles on top of the reactance circles, you would get a giant gobbledygookity mess, okay? Uh, so there's a very simple trick you can do with the Smith chart to turn all of these impedance circles into admittance circles, or I guess you call them reactance circles per se. <clears throat> By the way, this circle here, I believe is called an SWR circle. So keep that in mind. So to do my conversion from impedance to admittance, all I have to do is draw a line right down the middle. Here, use a different color. I'm gonna do this. Okay, and this is now my new starting point here. And instead of going around from here to this circle here, that arc length will actually correspond to this same arc over here. So let's, let's get another color here. So remember, this is the circle now my magic circle. I don't know if they have a real name in microwave engineering, but I like the phrase magic circle. So that's what I'm going to call it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so the idea wasn't, I don't really have this red circle, but if I do this little mirroring trick where I go uh, from one end of my SWR circle to the other, all of these circles now are flip flopping essentially relative to my point here. So now by starting here instead of here, I can treat this green circle as, a, as my admittance circle. That is to say, the distance of the arc from here up to here, or from here down to here, is identical to the arc from here to here, or all the way back to here. I just did a little bit of a mirroring trick so that I can exploit the circles that are already drawn on there. So that is the fun, neat little trick um, that we can follow. Uh, to to turn my Smith chart to, to do the, I guess you could say, to do the shunt stub matching network, right? Instead of starting here and then hitting this circle and adding a series line like I do with the series stub, I just do my 180 degree flip and then I go to this circle here because all the distances relative to each other are exactly the same as if I went to the red circle anyway. So that's the, the idea there, that little flippity flop there. Okay, and you can even read them off of the Smith chart directly. So we start, for example, I'm just going to do a very crude approximation. You draw a line right on out there. And you notice it went 0 0.21 here, wavelengths toward generator. So I start here. I need to know how many wavelengths toward generator until I intersect this point here. So I'm just going to draw another line like so. And you notice it is about... 0.402 or 404. So I'm just going to round that and pretend it's 0 0.4. It won't hurt my calculations too much. So the question is, what is the distance traversed here in terms of my electrical length, wavelengths towards generator? Well, it's just, I just say 0 0.4 minus 0 one <clears throat> and what do you get about 0 0.19 ish about there something like that plus or minus a few little degrees of uh, or digits of precision here so about that 0 0.19 so I can then do the exact same trick with my admittance circle here I start I go 180 degrees over here and instead of using this is my starting point and this is my finish I'm gonna just draw my line all the way out and you notice it starts at 0 0.46 and then instead of stopping here i'm going to stop over there and you see it's about 0 0.16 ish so this circle is hand drawn so there's going to be some error here naturally but this is how but presumably this arc length here is identical to this length over here the only issue is you're crossing zero here and you have to kind of correct for that so it would be 0 0.16 plus 0.04-ish, so you notice I'm reading <laughs> the inner values there. So 0.16, which is this length plus that length. And so that's 0.04, which is you notice is about 0.2, which agrees with what I did here. So obviously there's a little bit of sloppy error because I'm not using you know good tools for this, but you can see kind of how that idea hopefully works. <clears throat> Okay, but it's very important to think about this in terms of these traversals along the circle. So just to review, step one, I add this series length here, and that corresponds to traversals along this circle. And then eventually I'm gonna find one that intersects with the red here, 
and then I'm going to add some length in parallel, which will correspond to a traversal here until I hit the origin. But of course, I don't have this circle. I had to draw it in manually. So I need a way to convert <laughs> this in terms of what's already here. So instead, we do this 180 degree flip and that arc length I can now use on this main circle again to get the same result. Okay, and there is a way to read off this length L. You just have to basically, uh, I believe the way it works is you would have to start here and it goes all the way around. So there, there's another bit of addition of angles you gotta worry about there, <clears throat> which we'll talk about another time. But I just want you to have this sort of picture in your mind of how the, the length D and L here correspond to traversals along these circles. And again, there, there is a exact analytic formula to this, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, but we don't wanna to spend too much time really getting lost in the algebra. It's this sort of visualization again. We have the magic circles and the SWR circles and different lengths of D and L correspond to different arc traversals along these little circles. That's the main idea that we need to reinforce.